Some way back in 1934, a child was born in Santambu, Northwest region, who would eventually become a beacon of hope for the Cameroonian nation and people. Simon Achidi Achi was born of humble beginnings, but his ambitions went high above his family background. A committed farmer, a seasoned scholar, and a shrewd politician, Achidi Achi has had hard work as his guiding mantra, and that alone has endeared him both to his admirers and foes. He definitely acquired a large part of his character from his father, but has also got qualities of his own that continue to make him a success story today. Not everybody may agree, but Cameroon's former Prime Minister has carved himself out as a peace crusader, a philanthropist, an administrator, a lover of justice, and a committed farmer. Uh, I was born late in November 1934 in Santa by one who served Congo as his father. And then my mother is called Susanna May. So I was born by this big brother who grew up as peasant. My father was a peasant himself. But during a brief period, he was trained by the Germans and he had to work in the leprosy center, leprosy center, which is in Quebec. He worked there very briefly. And uh, he didn't, I think he didn't quite like the job, so he had to leave. And he started to settle on the streets of Santambu, which is part of the south of the south of the province of Congo. He tried to start a trade school there. In those early days, when he settled here, very briefly, he became a coffee farmer because he saw coffee being cultivated by the French colonial masters just across the street because they, are, they have a common boundary with Homa East Cameroon and Bushi Creek, West Cameroon. We are at the bo at border. Our farm is marked by the border, the two common streams all the way from Sydney. It flows through Matawi, so you have how to cross it. Since he was a very hard worker, he became a very successful farmer. And uh, that also encouraged him to form the cooperative in those days. The cooperative for which he built was more specialized. They used the house as a cooperative for stores. And then a small place like a post office, there's a small hole, there's a post office to house the farm. So with time, Just left the Union Army, which was a very big massacre in front of the press. I would imagine that when people know the truth, they will come and say to that old fellow, shut up. I do agree to know that. So he said that when he woke up at 5 o'clock, that was 6 o'clock, quarter of the hour, he went to the farm very early. coffee around the corner. It wasn't in a farm, it was in a plant just across the yard. Then he lit the bell just across the street and he left the barrel there. It's all I remember. So he went to the farm. It has never been a straight line with Achiri Achi as he went long distances in search of knowledge. Even without the right age for school, he would nevertheless be pushed by that overarching desire to learn, and he did excel in that endeavor. With his parents, the soil seemed like the only source of revenue. But the search for scholarship would push Achidachi to get jobs and resign from them all the same, a curious attitude for a man whose background ordinarily required him to stick to a job, no matter how uncomfortable it was. 
with very limited financial means, he had to combine work with scholarship and obtained his GCA advanced level through correspondence study. As a little boy, he already knew that hard work would be key to his emergence. As a university student, Achiri Achi would protest frequently against the injustices perpetrated against Anglophone students, already carving himself out as a potential political figure. As it were, the start was never rosy. It was born out of a stubborn drive to learn. When I came to study in Paris in 1946, I went to Vernacular School. Vernacular School was part of was a, a she was a evangelist who decided to open a Anglican school. I was there very briefly. Then I, I, I think I passed the honor school. When I got to the honor school, I was a the brother had to put my hand across my head to touch the other ear. My hands don't touch the other ear. So I could have made it. But I kept going to school that I didn't want to go. For kind, for kind. So I was very lucky. And then uh, during the year, the school that I went to, the year of the honor school I went to, the first of them, and I happened to be part of it. So the teachers went to us and tried to bring me into the next class. Class two. And I said, class two, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? But of course, finished class four. I went to the class four lecture room and the teacher taught me. In that honor school where I went, I was I was staying with one of my masters, one master who still passed on. He was the head master of the honor school in Paris. So That was an ambition. I was sitting there by my own rather than my master. And the teacher tried to leave Fanta. And at five o'clock in the morning, I would sit to study and get to home by four to study with a small bag of beans and then a small, what you call now, uh, the wheel of a bicycle or anything which I made. I would Playing and doing with that. That's what I used as an ambition. I continued the rabbit band in 1949 to 74. And when I passed the class five, then then the rabbit band really. And I had to come back and uh, then to run the boundary honor school. That's where I started my start in my own College of West Central to teach the courses in Government and Staff College. Government College, I was there for five years. Nineteen fifty, yeah, that is what I said. African Nineteen fifty eight. So I worked there for the first year from nineteen fifty eight. When I left college, I wasn't satisfied in college. I wanted to quit. But since I was worked in a senior African company for 30 years and didn't allow me enough time to do my other activities, because while then I did part-time business, I am to went to store, went to Lindo for part-time. 
the work that she does in allow me time to do some a few things especially my studies I wanted to commit to study abroad so I decided to return and join the Benin Diabetes Society and work as a professor in fact I worked there for some time and uh, during that time I did my studies at California in the department of history at Brown so I thought I could speak some subject better decided to go to look for better school. CDC offered me a job as a field management associate. That was uh, 1963 early, but it wasn't 60, 66, 67. CDC offered me a job as field management associate. It was a job that would have lasted two years because I did very well field training. I was the banana section of uh, Tombo, a digging job. Tombo, just across the lake, is a digging job. Okay? So the, and uh, I had to try to go back. A white statement may go forever with me. Then I remember the interview that I had with Abdul Thomas Patrick and uh, Francis Yango, who were all from the Ivory Coast University. While in, we are in the French res research, uh, we had done some French in Valley College. I took on this task. Uh, Francis Yango, who was very well, very good in French. Then my other colleagues who left that day, they could not join me. So I started struggling. I can still start it today when you look at it. It's a struggle still continues. So the chancellor of the university, one Mr. Caleb Green, who was a Rhodes Scholar in Southwest East, and those the Rhodes Scholars were very brilliant people. Out of uh, physics scholars, maybe for French, collected just about four or four schools. So Mr. Kellegren was our chancellor, I mean vice chancellor of the university. So we were very friendly, very friendly. So what he told us, Mr. Nobuji, if you give me, if you give us letters, you come and tell Fon Chaba, the university will not take our university. But if you come and tell Fon Chaba, we are not going to Because he sent us back, we were still on the same side. So we went, we went back to France. We were sent to France to go through a nine-month course. I was there for Kelly Hope and some scholars in French. So I decided to come back to college to pursue this. I decided to come back to English and to physics. But when I went to college, I thought that I could not do my PhD. School of Humanities Trade and Humanities Trade. School of Humanities Trade to International Humanities School of Humanities Trade. I went to the trade fair to logistics studies. I could translate it and kept it. At this festival, President Mugabe had me in his statist section, in my statist form, statist section, that is what I had done. And one of the young fellows led me to the museum brochure. And I came out for some very, very good lectures. There were audits which were done in the colonial days in Africa. There was quite a lot of prestigious discussion 
because while in USD, I'd work in the accounts department, and I used to do a lot of audit work. So I was knowledgeable. While as special counsel, the special counsel to the president, counsel to the public service, uh, secretary general. While in the public service section, they wanted me to go to Canada for the stock to come back. I can do about the development of the same one. I did go to Dubai for the development. Well, the president of this company said I should remain in Canada for a while. Before long, he transferred me to State Inspector Minister, Minister in charge of State Ordinary Affairs. I was there. Very briefly, too. When I stayed, I was there very briefly. I was quite, I used to be quite stubborn. Well, I wasn't stubborn at all. But when I believed in a thing, I was stubborn. When I believed that thing has to be done this way, I would do it. I would work on that and that and that. And that is how it has to be. That's how I have been. I work on it. The thing comes out this way. Where I started with one thing form of English course of some kind. I graduated that law and that science course. I was a professor in the PhD school of science and technology. So after some time, uh, the president Political side of it. So I was doing politics. Son of Manco, the man said, Son of Manco, he didn't want to bring politics or doctrine. Never decided to play my part. So I went to the Supreme Court. It was the first time, last election I joined the Supreme Court. I won and went to Parliament. I was only a private candidate. I come to me. So my brother come and said, You get the Supreme Court. So State inspector, I mean a minister of justice, I joined the Supreme Court in 95, where I took his own decision. He had his own rules by his own rules. I think he had he followed had thought it better. I went to Parliament then. That is the period of time when I was I came to Parliament for the first time. And I was appointed. I was the honor of the SPA. Didn't make it when I went to Parliament. The president was going to resign me because I had uh, power to that time. I now have uh, the report of the the prime minister, the head of government, and so on. So the right was quite a lot of. In fact, the president had exhibited a lot of foresight and ingenuity in choosing power to that time because he chose me like he drew a straight line he was looking at me saying which according to my appreciation he realized that meeting was not important he would understand that when my power to that day came to power and the prime minister my country was burning and this is the period when uh, the, the, the greatest political crisis in our country was occurred during the period i remember the destruction that happened in the country i remember the burning the burning the killing really that uh, our country faced during that period. And uh, uh, we were still making our first step into a democracy that the president introduced. And uh, we needed somebody who would be able to pacify the people. We needed somebody who would be able to uh, unite the people. And the Prime Minister of Peter Kay was chosen just at that moment to put her name on this report. Because we remember that during that period, power to that day succeeded in bringing together all Ambassadors from the north, from the south, from the east, from the west, and then 
So remember the number of delegations that came to the kingdom to exercise their powers, to enjoy it in the kingdom, they were to console them, they were ready to encourage them. Others who were even insulting him, others who wrote the terrible articles against him in the newspaper, they accepted everything and the powers of the throne were with him. We remember his house was uh, a, a meeting point for Cameroonians. In fact, it's like Cameroonians who were hungry and had nothing to eat had to go to his house and eat because from morning to evening he had a long table where people could come and uh, eat with him. Those who, those who were annoyed when they got uh, to his house and by the time they went out, they were packed because he was ready to, uh, to, to encourage them, ready to make them promises and even offered love to the people who came to the kingdom. So I think he was born a peacemaker. He was born somebody who was who was ready to pacify who wanted to put people together. And he has lived in that as prime minister of South Africa. It's a big, big lesson to all of us that is in the meeting hall or in the corner room. So we will accept him. is one of the greatest political figures you can think about that has come to Benin uh, because he's contributed so much to his uh, political uh, uh, activities in this country. His first policy was prior to that was the first in which many people admired and that is humanity. Prior to that is a humble person because he was ready to do and talk or have that list with anyone as a senior clerk, be it a villager, be it anyone, young or old. So he's a humble person and uh, anyone can approach him. I want to say uh, Pa Asidatu is a generous person. He's even generous to the poor because I've seen somebody who is ready to sacrifice all his wealth, all his property to feed the poor. He was a very firm man, but his father was being found out. Because of the fear of the father, he was not found out. How to manage it? He that is found out. How to manage it while activities are in progress? That's why I was joining to a lot of people who were saying they thought that politics was violent. Politics has never been violent. Politics is like wooing a girl to marry. You are wooing a girl to marry. You meet the brother. You meet the father. You burn his house. Eh? You meet the uncle, you burn his car. Will you marry the girl? But these things are told. These are things are told us. So you will fail in the end. You will fail. Politics has never been. Violence has never existed. When you sow, you will reap. So we continued. After that, when I removed from Ghana, I came to Africa. Came back home and continued where you have led me. Yes. He does everything that our father used to do. He gets up at 5 30, he's already on the farm. He eats there, comes back, and go. He spends, in fact, the whole, the whole of his life on the farm. And we too, we've copied that good example from him. I can say that we still depend on him for advice, because he advises us every day. He's a developer. He's a developer. He develops very well. Not only in Bay, but in the Northwest as a whole. Ajide Achu, the politician, was just as successful as the farmer from academic. He could have a masterless light even over slippery political terrain. He is today an arch political opponent to Cameroon's frontline opposition leader, Ni Jan Frundi. But the two of them had been in talking terms, even as opponents, under the same political canopy, the CPDM. Today, they disagree almost on everything, except when it comes to the family to which they both belong. They were brothers, but and both the same village, same, the same family. They mainly separated, one over the hill and another this way. We are brothers. We and. Uh, we never disagreed family-wise. Particularly, no, I never disagreed with anybody. You wrong me, I just leave it. 
The policy we did within one party that he was sober. I think he observed what we the elders were doing and he did the same. He wasn't wise. But when he created his own party, he flooded up like wildfire. So when he became formed his own party, he became the reverse of what he was in S in CPD. We militated in the same party when Cameroon was a one party system. Yes. When I contested with Simon Achidia, uh, Honorable Simon Achidia Chu, and found out that things were not going on well, I resigned then after the 1988 elections. So Mr. Simon Achidia Chu tells you that he is in the CPDM because he is a disciple of uh, Mr. Paul Beer. He supports his ideology. Whether it's wrong or right, he is with him. As a politician, I want to propose that the best system of governance for Cameroon is a federal system of governance, where the people of the different federated states have their budgets, they sit in their local governments, debate, and do their things. He started out as a farmer in these modest surroundings. Like a wheel that is constantly turning, he is back to the farm after moving up the political and administrative ladder capped by his appointment as Cameroon's Prime Minister in 1992. Unlike most government officials who use their positions to amass wealth, Achidi's rock farm home remains a living testament to his virtue of humility. Rather, he believes in sharing with the poor and the destitute. I look like a key that can fit in a door. Pass back through. I can fit in a door. I'm a village, typical village man. Well, my house shows you. I have never been so rich as to build a better house. Before I became a PM, I had that house. It's still standing. All what I have is what I acquired ever before I became a big man. Uh, it's not that I've not had money in my life. I've had money. But most of my money has gone for philanthropic work. If you came to my house in downtown Santa or here, between 5.30 and 7, you find all sorts of people. Blind people, lame people, sick people, and so on, who are soliciting for help. So most of what I earned in my life went for philanthropic work. I have a handicap center and metalism. A handicap center, very big. When you are going to crossing over to Babaju, just that before you get to the toll gate, you should find a big building on the left that's constructed by me. That's a handicap center. Is uh, one of my son, and one of my best son, quite right. He had uh, been the Minister of Justice, has been the Prime Minister, he's back home with me. I had uh, gave him face recognition when uh, he was uh, the Minister of Justice. Second one was uh, when he became the Prime Minister. And he's one of my notable. He had been working with the people of the village very well. With the children, with the youth, and, and uh, even more abroad. I would have loved that the government should try him again. So that uh, by the experience that he has now, he can work with the government very well. Peace has obviously been a key value for Simon Achiriachu. The President of the Republic did identify this trait and appointed him Prime Minister at a time Cameron was still making his first staggering steps into multi-party democracy. The country's peace was at the time threatening to fall over the cliff as political tensions and difficult living conditions strained relations between the government and the governed. He carried out national tours preaching the doctrine of peace, reconciliation, and tolerance. For wining and dining, even with 
people whose political thoughts did not tally with his, Achidi Acho frequently received disapproval from members of his own party. But he was conscious of the fact that violence has never been a solution to any problem. Instead, he cautioned tolerance and hard work as the only means of getting Cameroon away from the abyss. I think, first of all, God has a hand in it. You have to decide to be an example. I don't insult. I don't retaliate. You do what you want. I will not retaliate. I will not be violent. I will not hate you. I would rather pray for you. So when I became prime minister, just the day the president appointed me, I was in the hotel mentally. I just went to my room. I wanted to pray. I was just thinking what to tell God. And then, Pap, you journalists, you know, you intrude everywhere, you push the door. My bodyguard came and said, the journalist went, want you. So they interrupted. I came to the door, they said, Pa, we want to see you. I said, yes. They said, well, they're pushing in so many. So I went out. I said, yes, Pa. You are not prime minister of turbulent period. What will you do to bring peace to Cameroon? Cameroonians are hungry. They have no money. They are all violent and so on. I said, well, what I will do is I just preach to them. I said, what do you preach? I tell them, peace, reconciliation, hard work. These words came from what I don't know. They were sent by word. They said, what do you preach? I said, yes, when people are peaceful, is that right? When they are peaceful and they work hard, they are sure to reap the fruit. And that has been preached here today. That's what came into my mind. So when somebody came to me in violence, when I was PM, SDF, UNDP, SDF especially, they come from Norway. Please, I have a contact here, this, that. Please, sir, did this. I said, come. I will solve this problem. When he starts to say, Pa, you know, I'm now SDF, it was not my intention. I said, no, no, my son, my daughter, no, no. We don't talk politics here. We talk family, we talk father and son. I never, never, never antagonize anybody or any political. I help mostly SDF people. So that when we sat in my dining room, dining, long table, I had a long table, probably, you know, some of you saw it. No? And uh, the SCPD and people come in, they see an SDF man by my right, SDF man. They were fire angry. They were being refused to eat. <laughs> Why? So I serve everybody. When it's time for policy, we talk policy. I say, both vote for me this time. They're not all. My elder brother, all along, has been a wonderful politician. He has created history. For the past years, I've worked with him as a, his protocol. He rendered wonderful services in Cameroon, in this nation. He is the father of peace in this nation. When things were hot, he went round, he entered holes, villages, just to quell down tension, when there was tension in Cameroon. So all along, we were together, yes. So, he, in fact, he rendered good services to this nation and to Cameroonians. Helped even individuals. Up to now that we are still talking, he's still happy. He was very welcoming and uh, smiles to everyone. Even when you insulted him, he smiles to you. He tells you to calm down, he gives you a drink. He serves you. You could remember when uh, Prime Minister, as Prime Minister, when he received visitors, he stood of himself to serve them. He was just short of cleaning the plates for the, his guests. So that smiling nature made people to call him Le, 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 Le Vache Kiri uh, because he smiled all the time. And uh, he didn't mind that. And uh, he continued smiling and continued to win the admiration of Cameroonians and even that of the head of state. Even up to today, I think he's one of these politicians who know that he said, I'm nice enough, and once in a while would even call him.
to chat with him and consult him. Honorable Simon Achide Aki was born of peasant farmers. After his meteoric rise to the citadels of power and privilege, he had never forgotten about where he came from. The former prime minister has retired from active public service but has come back to his first love, farming. His rock farms that span over a surface area of 420 hectares have become the envy of many. Combining food crop farming and animal rearing, Pa Achidi, as he is fondly called, can easily pass for one of the greatest farmers in his native northwest region and perhaps in Cameroon. His integrated farming system has given rise to the rearing of some of the finest breeds of cattle in the region. Conscious of the fact that his animals could face hunger sometimes, he has dedicated large portions of the land to grow feed for the cattle. As demand rises continuously for dairy products, the Santa farmer has set aside some of his cattle for milk production. These are given special fattening foods to enable their milk flow. Achiri Achiu inherited most of his traits as a farmer from his father, the only difference being that today, farming can be done on a much more larger scale thanks to the use of modern machinery. I go to bed early, before 10. I wake up 5 o'clock, take my bath, dress in my professional attire, farming attire. If that is on holiday line, I wake up my children. We all come to work. I pass and collect the workers. We come to farm. And before 12, 1 o'clock latest, we close. And we feed, we feed heavily. I don't believe in starving. The, my people cook every day well. The worker drink at least two plates or three plates of milk or everywhere. We eat well. I keep cows. I keep goats and sheep and a few horses. I cultivate potatoes, Irish potatoes, a lot of it. Probably I'm the heaviest producer in Norway. Simon Achidachu himself is not like an executive who runs his farms from the safety of the office. He rises up with the others and retires with them, making sure that the right thing is done on the ground. The scale of rock farms definitely requires the input of many people. In a country where jobs are hard to come by, in a country where close to 40% of the population live below the poverty line, the rock farms are a source of respite for scores of youths who toil from dawn to dusk to make ends meet. The toil-hardened hands of these men and women have become so more used to the hoes. Care is taken to establish a sense of uniformity and beauty on their farms. This is a farm where dry seasons are not known because an advanced irrigation system has been developed. Water is channeled from its source through pipes to various sections of the farm. The soil here is suitable enough for Irish potato production. In just a few months, the potato plants blossom and bloom and give the picture of a sort of garden of Eden and the crops receive maximum care. Achidi is obviously the biggest potato farmer in the Northwest region. With water available all year round, he seeks to ensure that harvest come throughout the year. The harvest season is one of the busiest because keeping potatoes too long in the ground will lead to huge losses. This is a perishable gold that needs special storage facilities. Wooden platforms have been built to make sure the harvest get enough air and therefore preserved for long. 
The potato seeds are constantly shuffled to allow air through them. Producing potatoes on a commercial scale like this also requires a ready market. And the market is not wanting. Most of the produce here is packaged and then exported to more needy countries like Gabon, Equatorial Guinea, and the Congo, besides satisfying local needs. A bag of potato here sells at 40,000 francs. It is this farm that scores some men and women work daily to make their lives. To forestall any water shortages, water storage tanks have been set up. Water is stored in these tanks and released during the dry seasons or periodically released to fill the platform where animals drink. Fish farming is obviously another area of importance to Simon Achideachu and he is just too proud to talk about it. I produce fish. I've harvested fish from that pond about 12.8 kilograms. Mock fish. Big, big issue. Diversification is a key aspect of the rock farms. Besides potato farming, animal breeding and fisheries, medicinal plants are also part of the farms. This diversity of products is obviously designed to get maximum benefits from such integrated agricultural practice. But Simon Achidi Achu is apparently disappointed that Cameroonians have not been able to appropriately exploit the blessings of the soil. If Cameroonians had grown on their own, no interference with colonialism and so on, we send big, big uh, Greek engineers. by developed cultures which we mix up in our heads and we're confused sometimes. If Cameroonians are not gone abroad, if you watch, most Cameroonians who are not highly educated, they are level-headed. But a lot of them who are highly educated, they only talk education. Is there any reason why our white Greek engineers who are doctors in agriculture and so on have not been able to develop simple mechanic instruments like tractors, instruments that can harvest potatoes, instruments that can plant potatoes, then everything. Honorable Simon Achideachu might have retired from active public life, but a politician in him has not yet gone to rest. On a daily basis, he brings his huge experience to inspire younger generations of politicians. But today's politicians find in him a valuable resource to be used to play politics the right way. They call me to give advice. I go. I usually, and they usually call me in Kambe, Wumso. The militants want me to come and give advice, but I cannot do all that. So I try to limit. It's just your own. You have good results. Scratch my back is give and take. The lives of great men are always generally shaped by personal effort. But the humble amongst them always remembers that there is a superior being without whom nothing is possible. This is obviously where Achidi fits in. He is a fervent Presbyterian Christian and frequently plays key roles in the working of the church. His humility transcends his stature as a former prime minister, and so he demonstrates the same leadership in the house of God. Like every other human being, Simon Achidachu has had his own fair share of sorrows. Death has not been so kind to him and has taken away some of his loved ones. He has lost people so dear to him, especially that of a lovely wife. Such moments of sorrow like the joyous ones can understandably not be wanting in a man with a family as large as that of Achidi. And naturally, he enjoys the company of his wives, his children, and grandchildren. I have a large family. I learned that from my cultures and my parents. I have many wives. 
have many children. My father was a heavy philanthropist with a big family. But he cared for them. He cared for any child who came across our compound went to school. If you have two or three w- wives, you don't do have time. Have time to spend with them. Why not? For a woman, it's difficult to appreciate. But a man can appreciate. You have uh, two or three wives. This one has a child. Or oh, this one, th- this week, this one is seven years. Next week, and so on. Is that not easy? In the family, he's, he, he hasn't, he renders good services in the family as also in the whole nation. I think he was born like that because our father too was, you know, a man of the people. Today, uh, we know Pa Chidacho to be somebody who is present at all events when he's invited in the village at all funerals. He is there to console the people. He is ready to assist them. Every morning, if you go to his house, you find people lined up to ask for assistance. And Pa Chidacho is ready to offer them his assistance. Pa Chidacho is a grassroots man. He's a man who has taught us grassroots politics because he says politics is a game of masses. If you have to succeed in politics, you must be in touch with the population. You must deal with them. You must accept them. You must live with them. And that is just what he has done all through his life. And uh, that has earned him the prestige and uh, the esteem which uh, many Cameroonians are feeling today. Even on retirement, President Paul Bia still considers Simon Achidiachu an important asset to the country's economic development and appointed him board chair of the National Investment Corporation, the SNI. Set up in 1964, the SNI is a state-owned corporation that provides support to viable and economically profitable projects. As the state recognizes his managerial finesse, so too does the private sector. That is why he was equally made board chair of the Baminda University of Science and Technology bust. All these responsibilities do not take Simon Achide Achu away from his moments of leisure. His presence everywhere emits sparks of joy, a feeling of warmth, and a symphony of brotherhood. He would dance and wine with people from all social strata, irrespective of social rank, education, or political leaning. I find enough time for my leisure, for going to visit friends, we sit and drink a beer in the club or somewhere, we chat and talk nonsense, and talk sense and talk nonsense and so on. But basically, I spend a lot of my time thinking what I can do for people rather than myself. I've educated hundreds and hundreds of children in my life who are not my children. I don't even know them. Some come, they introduce themselves, they say, Pan, I made it, I say, thank you. Some bring gifts. Achidi's idea of how Cameroon can move ahead is pecked on spiritual revival, where love, tolerance, and forgiveness will flow abundant. To make Cameroon move ahead, simply, all Cameroonians should decide, one, to be honest, to be hardworking, to be sympathetic, brotherly and sisterly. When you are hardworking, you are godly, you know, see. When you are kind, sympathetic, you are godly. And then when you forgive, don't revenge. If you do this, you can communicate with God easily. You speak to God. And God, you open your mind, your eyes to see you. you can communicate. So Ajit's story is that of a man born of humble beginnings. But by dint of hard work, personal sacrifice, and parental guidance, he rose to greatness. His story is the great teacher of personal will, where obstacles are usually turned into opportunities. As age acts him away, Cameron's former prime minister still defies age 
to hold on to the mantra that propelled him to prominence in the first place, hard work. He may sooner or later leave the scene like others before him, but one thing is clear, his soul will go marching on.